That's Mr. Delgado. Welcome everybody, bienvenidos. Uh, I'm gonna, in the brief minute that I have, I'm gonna mention some concepts about what Hispanic or Latino means because there is, this is a confusing term for a lot of people. One of the definition of, definitions of Hispanic is that this refers to people born or with origins in a country covered by Spaniards and for whom Spanish is the primary language. In contrast to Latino, the general definition refers to people born in a country where language evolved from Latin. So this is a lot of countries and there are many languages that evolved from this. Some of the most common ones include Spanish, of course, Italian, French, uh, Romanian, and there are several others like Catalonian and several that are spoken in small areas of Europe. So this is the map that green, the areas in green are the places where the Spanish is spoken by, the, by a significant proportion of the population. So this, is, this involves in, this involves Mexico on your left, then all the countries in Central America except for Belize, and even in Belize there are some Spanish speaking people. And then you can see in South America, uh, there are 9 out of 13 countries where Spanish is the main language. And then according to this definition, if you see in Africa, show this, this little point there, so that's Equatorial Guinea where Spanish is the official language, so technically according to the definition of Hispanic, that could be also a Spanish population, of course Spain in Europe in the map. Now, these are the usual definitions, however, the U.S. Census Bureau has its definition and this is Hispanic, Latino, and Spanish, according to the MR used interchangeably. It's not very precise, but that's the functional way that it's been done, and that's the way that the census in 2010 uh, worked. And according to that census, uh, the projection for 2013 is that about over 17% 17, 17 of the population is Hispanic, so this makes the Hispanics the largest majority in the country. And then uh, they mention in particular the countries where most of the Hispanic population, population comes from, so Mexico represents about two thirds, uh, no, two thirds of the total, followed by uh, Puerto Rico and then uh, Cuba has over 3%, and then there are many other countries. Now the point that needs to be very clear is that uh, people who identify their origins as Spanish, Hispanic, or Latino may be of any race, and that, that needs to be very clear because sometimes there is some confusion about it. Now I'm gonna mention some concepts that can be useful for healthcare. So, one is that many Hispanics and some of the residents might, might have noticed that already in, in their clinics. You ask the patient about to do something and the patient will try to uh, ask another family member before doing anything. And that's very common, that's for taking medications, that's for doing some changes in health behavior. And that is called as familism. So, Sometimes the individual is not as considered as important as the community, the family. Uh, so this can be a double-edged sword. This can be an important motivator for uh, disease management if that family is supportive. But on, on the other side, it can make it difficult for patients to make independent decisions. So again, some of us have experienced that, that we are very pressured in terms of time seeing the patients and the patient doesn't want to take a decision, and if we call them, they still, let me ask my, my wife, let me ask Sasha, let me check with my brother. So, with the type of training, sometimes that can be a little bit uh, desperating for us, but we need to bear in mind that this is part of the culture, and we need to understand it. Now, another concept is machism, machismo. So, this term identifies but uh, attitudes associated with the concept of masculinity. So, machismo in general has been 
thought of as something negative, and certainly there are many negative aspects. Some of those include uh, actions uh, that the individual can take to prove that he's macho, and that can lead to negative behaviors, like uh, risk-taking things, driving under the influence, drinking too much. So that, those are some of the negative. Also, in this concept of being macho, people are, su are supposed to endure pain, not complain, so that can lead uh, to people not seeking medical attention when, when it is needed. Now, there are some positive aspects, because one of those is that the macho needs to be a good provider for the family, needs to be the breadwinner, and there are, so there can be good work, working at edits, and there can be a good family protection. Now, since the man is usually a breadwinner, and sometimes the only breadwinner, uh, the, they will seek for attention if the disease is affecting their working capacity. So we need to take care, we need to take care advantage of that and emphasize to the patients this will affect your working possibilities unless you do this and that. Now, we think that the macho culture will prevail, but in reality, women are the ones that usually get away with things. So they have a key role in health decisions. So usually, male patients will ask their wives or their female partners about decisions to take. Many times you will see that the male patient will come uh, with the with the female partners. They will ask the female partner, partners about what to do. And so this is not important because another point important because if we need to work with the wives or the, or the females, try to educate them because then that's gonna be reflected for the male partners and for the rest of the family. There's another bad one that is called fatalism. Fatalismo. And this is the belief that individuals can I don't tell the disease process because this is part of their destiny. I got diabetes, I'm screwed. So <laughs> this, is, this is something that is very common and this may lead to less adherence to a recommended treatment plan. There was a survey done in Hispanic patients and as you can see 70% believe that they had a disease because of gas well. And over 80% thought that only God could control their disease. So that made them feel less uh, capable of doing something on their own. So that's something to take into account and we need to try to convince the patient that, about what they can do for themselves. Now, there are also some religious beliefs that are positive. One of those is that religion is frequently associated with a support system gives patients that this feeling strength to cope with disease and the ability to face fears and keep a positive attitude. So another one is called personalism. Personalism. This is the expectation that the patient will develop a personal relationship with their healthcare provider and this goes beyond what that disease is per se. So some patients are looking for somebody that is asking questions not only about the disease, but about their family, what they think, what their history was, that engage with them in a more personal way. And a lot of patients like more close con uh, physical contact, at least handshaking for the young ones, high-fiving, some people like even hugging. So those are other aspects. So the one looks pretty cold, that not be very attractive for patients, and they might not be as willing to come the next time. There are some unfathomed fears. I'm going to mention this example of how diabetes being an endocrinologist myself. So there was a survey in which 43% of patients thought that insulin causes blindness, blindness. So, and this is very common and we face this all the time. Dr. Kajas has seen that for years. Another very interesting one, one of my favorites, the so-called SUSTO. Susto means like fright or surprise. This is it means that there was a startling event and that led to diabetes. A lot of people believe that. That's very, very common and and you won't be able to convince sometimes 
people that this is not the case. And in reality, in many cases, it doesn't matter. So another point that may can make difficult sometimes treatment, or we can take advantage of some aspects, is that family celebrations usually involve a lot of social pressure to overeat, and not only celebrations, sometimes just being in a family setting. And declining food can be seen as very impolite. It's not socially acceptable in some cases. Then there's this concept regarding body image that robustness can be seen as a positive aspect. And that's important to take into account. And actually there are some studies showing that some Hispanics are less likely to perceive themselves as overweight or, or obese because of this. So these are some points that I wanted to uh, mention and I'll return to Mr. Degas. Thank you.